This podcast is sponsored by the Tollington Arms on Hornsey Road, a bubbly pub with a Thai kitchen, home to thousands of Arsenal fans every season. Open daily from noon. Hello and welcome to the Guna Ramble podcast. I'm your host, Giles. And joining me today... There's a regular Warren. How you doing, Warren? Who's settled in in uh, where? Yeah, mate, after the morning. Wherever moment, you are, back, should I say? Wherever I am, yeah, yeah back to normal today and um, yeah. back on the pod, so looking forward to it, mate. Good stuff. Uh, today we've got a special guest. We've got Phil Costa. Uh, you might have seen him writing for you, Max It Football or the set pieces. He also is one part of the very, 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 very exceptional Scouted Football website um i'm happy to have you on phil welcome to the show hi mate no pleased to be here so yeah hopefully uh we can get some good discussions going for for all the listeners indeed 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 all right let's let's kick off um just want to really get a summary from you guys about uh, sunday's game against city um you know it was very odd i mean I, i was there i think we're all there very old atmosphere for me. Um, when the Rocky, when the seventh minute Rocky remembered or Rocky, 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 Roadcastle chant came up, it was very sporadic for me where I was and, you know, um, West, West Low, it was very sporadic. It didn't seem to be unified. There was no mention of it on the, uh, on the big screens. And obviously I suppose maybe we just conceded a goal. So maybe that might have affected, you know, uh, fans enthusiasm and whatnot. But I mean, the atmosphere generally, how did you find it, Phil? I thought the atmosphere was quite strange, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, we started poorly. Uh, I mean, what the score after what, three or four minutes, but even so, it you know we're playing Manchester City at home, and it was just really, really flat. I mean, it was quiet. There was the occasional, you know, uh, there was someone trying to get a few chants going from from around the ground, but nothing really caught on. I think the nervousness just filtered through from the fans and then it sort of filtered through the manager and, and even the players. I mean, you know, it, it showed in the game as well. There was just no intensity to our play or even cities, to be honest. I think it was just, it was almost like a friendly, a pre-season friendly at times. Um, so yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what to make of it, to be honest. Was, what do you reckon? I mean, like, like, um, Phil said, and it was very, it seems to, it seems like, you know, the, the, the weirdness, the, the unfamiliarity of the atmosphere actually filtered and permeated onto the actual grass, the field of play. The, 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 that, that kind of unfamiliarity is becoming a bit of a familiarity for me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really is at home going, it, it's, it's becoming such a, such a strange place to watch a football at the moment, yeah, Maritz, and it, the uncertainty on the pitch and, and in the, in the, in the stands, I mean, you can feel it, like you said. You can feel it. You can feel uh, an edginess, like. But there's an uncertainty around the entire football club at the moment, and it's definitely, definitely filtering through to the, to the fans, to the stands. I mean, even our away fans are exceptional, and even in away games at the moment, it's, 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 it's strange. It's, it's, it's a strange. Normally, nine times out of ten, you go to a away game singing throughout, fantastic. But lately, it's just, and there's, there's a really weird, weird situation at the club at the moment, and. And, and like Phil alluded to, we're, we're playing Manchester City at home. It's a big, big game. Both sides need to win. We're desperate for points. They're desperate for points. And it it, it just never, ever woke up, did it? Like, really, it, it just, even though it was 2 all and it, there was chances galore and, and things like that were happening, when it really pushed come to shove, both teams just sort of went out of a whimper. And it was, it was just odd. Really, yeah. really odd, it, odd, odd game. Even our equalisers weren't really roundly celebrated like you would expect it to have been. Do you know what I mean? Like the first equaliser, Theo, like, you know, there was, even the players themselves seemed, I don't know, I, I just didn't, I didn't understand it. I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I don't know. I mean, let's go on to the, the, the key moments of the game. I mean, the first goal, a lot of people were saying were, again, blasting Mustafi for leaving his station, getting ahead of the ball. But, you know, um, for me, I think he, you know, he did the right thing. I mean, if you look at our setup, you know, uh, Welbeck was uh, blocking the side pass to Otamendi, and then obviously Jacques and I had to push out to to take care of the first receiver, receiver who generally tended to be Fernandino, which left the space 
in his area. Don't know where Cochrane was. Uh, could have been marking his own man. I'm not sure, but obviously there's a big space in that area, and you're not going to let Aguero run into that central position unopposed. You know, um, obviously, you know, um, Mustafi's got a good header on it, and then it was a really good pass through the middle um, to Sane and um, Phil. You said in the recent past that you don't think that um, Bellerin's fully recovered or has had a chance to really get back up to speed since his ankle injury. Could that have played a part? I mean, the rustiness, you know, being the wrong side of of his man, or is it just a, a series, a catalogue of systemic errors that led to that first goal? I'm not, I'm not sure, really. I think you could definitely make a case for Bellerin not being 100% fit. I mean, when he picked up that, that ankle knock against Tottenham, I believe it was Danny Rose in the last minute, um, it, it, he was sort of going to be out for eight weeks, and he came back in about five, and... At Arsenal, people coming back early is is always strange. Um, and I think we sort of had to force him back because, you know, Gabriel did OK. Um, but I, we lacked a lot of sort of pace and then product down the right hand side, which made us very predictable because we kept putting everything down the left. So, yeah, and, you know, Jenkinson and Debushi, you know, they're not really adequate options. And I'll be very surprised if they're still here next next season. So I definitely think. There's something there. I mean, he's still quick, don't get me wrong, but, you know, Sane's, Sane's lightning quick as well. And, but he just seemed to breeze past him. I know it's difficult when you're last man because you, you don't want to touch them and bring them down, but um, I thought he maybe could have got into that space a bit quicker, that Mustafi vacated. Um, I mean, to be honest, we know what we're going to get with Mustafi. He, he likes to come and attack the ball early, and I didn't I didn't really see a problem with that. I think De Bruyne controlled it well and, and put a brilliant part, like a pass through. But yeah, I think it was just the structure wasn't quite quite right. Jacker maybe could have slotted in a bit more. Bellerin could have could have come in. But yeah, I think it was just some early nerves and a, and a bit of rustiness that that cost us the goal. Really. Uh, how did you how did you figure that out? And how did you look at that term for was? Yeah, I mean, Phil's covered it pretty well, to be honest mm. with you, mate. I think there were there was for me there was a few individual errors, but also. You could maybe look at the system. It's, it's almost as if no one really knows where to go and what to mm. do. And, and, and one of them's pressing at one time and then Mustafi's flying forward. And like you said, Jack has gone on to Fernandinho, but where's Coquelin? And it, it, there's no structure to the, it's not as if you can clearly see that Wenger's gone out and said, look, first 10 minutes, press high, press everyone, press high, make sure you hunt as a pack because only a couple of the players did. And then, Bellerin's, Bellerin's error is just an individual error. I mean, it's intelligent from Sane, but we got away with one just before, if you remember. Mm. Um, and Ospina saved, I think, was it Aguero who went through? It was, they, they basically went on the inside again. That was a calling it, card, wasn't it? Exactly, mate. And, and, and when you make that error once and get away with it against a side like City, it certainly can't happen again and definitely not within the next few minutes. And Bellerin's form has been a worry of late and, we did. For me, I just think it's absolutely ludicrous that a club of our size haven't uh, have been playing Gabriel at right back. I just can't. I can't. It was clear to us last summer that Matthew De Bruyne really was probably either going to leave the club or wasn't going to play much part. Jenkinson. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just can't understand how we've got Hector Bellerin, who's such a talent, but he's playing so so many games and there is there's no respite for him and he's. The way we play and the way we utilise him, he's so important. And when he does have a bad game, you notice it so much because he's he's been super reliable and super consistent for a player of his age. But he's, when he does make the odd mistake, it, it tends to be very, 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 very noticeable because he, he rarely makes them. But yeah, it was a definitely it was a bad mistake. And to be honest with you, it was a, we was all at sea, I thought, for the first sort of 15, 20 minutes. I just couldn't. It, it was terrible. And, you know... and. We kind of managed to gradually work our way back into the game, and then obviously um, Theo's taken advantage of uh, Clichy's uh, defensive uh, error to score the equaliser. And at that point, um, you're thinking, right, let's manage this next five, ten minutes or so. You know, let's, you know, we've we've been caught with our pants down far too often this season, where we've scored a goal and we've allowed the opposition to come back and and, and nick one straight after. And once again, you know. This one is partly systemic because you don't want your, you you don't want um, Xhaka, who's your defensive middle, to be midfielder to be up on the left hand side ahead of your number ten. 
you know. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously the, the the individual mistakes come from Ozil's failure to actually, you know, pass pass the ball to him. Again, um, we were very slow to react. Was um, and you know yeah. it was really really slow reaction, really bad game management and, and poor reactions, and we're in the, we're in the mire again, aren't we? Incredible. I, I found that absolutely disgusting. When I watched it back, when Ozil gives the ball, he gives the ball away once, then he miscontrols it again twice, and we've lost it. There's a, there's a, a, at least another 10, 15 seconds before the ball hits the net, and then after that, another five or six individual errors happen. Like you said, we've got Xhaka out on the left wing. Our left winger, Alexis, is up front. We're five on five. We were literally five on five when against we lost them that ball. Not. Against, against Man City. How is that even feasible? It, it cannot happen. And that sort of summed up. We, we started poorly. We got back in the game. And, and like you said, pants down again. The, the, the lack of... What the hell was going on? Like, what... That, that to me, is a lot, a lot deeper than... When you see that many players make that many mistakes and, and we see it again, we win the tackle in the box and then it comes out and poor old Monreal is, he's doing the, um, he's doing the okie cokey in, out, in, out, shake it all about. He don't know what way to go. And it, it's, it's not his fault. He's, he's horrifically exposed and just what a terrible, terrible goal to concede with a catalogue of errors with so many different players in wrong positions and wrong areas. And my God, it, we, we just didn't look coached. We didn't look organised. We didn't look balanced. And we didn't look like a football team, and we certainly didn't look like Arsenal Football Club. It was it was terrible, mate, to give City that many blatant opportunities and make that many mistakes in a big game is just unforgivable, really. Um, Phil, do you <clears throat> do anything more you want to add to to your obs- to the observations of that that second goal? Not really. I think no. it was covered it well. Yeah. I think it was just you know there was errors all over the pitch. Really, I mean, we've always had issues with you know game management over the last over the last few years and it was just another another example of that really we should have just I think we scored in in the 40th minute we should have just got got together and said look okay we haven't done great we'll somehow you know managed to claw our way back into this let's just settle it down and get into half time where we can regroup again and that was you know Ozil giving the ball away was was lazy Jacka made no real attempt to to come back for his for his men Monreal you know I thought maybe he got sucked to the ball a bit too easily, but he had to he had to make a decision, and in that heat of the moment, he happened to make the wrong one. And even Ospina, I think he got beat. I mean, it was a a, a decent shot by Aguero. He found the corner, yeah, but, but I yeah. think Ospina was. Do you think was he was po- Do you think he was put off by who was it that was sliding in to try and? I think some, it was Coquelin. Was it Coquelin? Yeah. Do you think yeah. he might have been? I mean, I I agree with you. I think he he could have made a better effort of trying to get down I, to I it. I think he might have been mm-hmm. distracted. I'm not sure you know, what, what what the exact sequence of events was. But I think it sort of went under his arm as mm. he dived and you, you'd ideally want your, your goalie to be a big presence there and get his body behind the ball. And I don't think, I don't think he did that, you know, that well the, enough. Exactly. And, and, and the thing is, Aguero's not really got much to aim at. There's a really, it's a really acute angle there, you know. So you would have thought, you know, he had all his angles covered, but maybe the balance was wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe whoever it was that was sliding in might have put him off. But yeah, I, I agree. It was... Um, it was poor on, on, on his part. I mean, I suppose um, second half, give us credit for, or oh, it's up to you, I don't know where, how you guys see it, whether you give us credit for fighting our way back or you think it's more a case of um, Man City took their, took their feet off of our, of our, off of our throat. I'm um, not sure how you saw it was. I, I thought we were there for the taking. But then once, once we did get that equaliser with Mustafi and we did sort of, we started to look a little more dangerous on, we looked like we could start utilising our pace and, and as soon as we did get a foothold in the game, I thought he made the subs that, that took us back out of the game and I really do think if, if City were, were at it and really wanted it, they could have gone for the jugular. But another thing just quickly to add, the mess in the middle of the park, the amount of mm. times that City had the space on the edge of the box we're playing two defensive midfielders side by side as a flat two. And I must have counted on seven or eight occasions where you had a Manchester City player within 20 to 30 yards out in the centre of the pitch on the edge of the box. And I couldn't see Xhaka or Coquelin anywhere. I I couldn't see where they were. And and we saw it with a goal like where Monreal had to make the decision and then he easily gets bypassed where there's no... I just don't know what was going on with with our whole structure, our whole balance and the, the whole way we were playing. But what 
did happen is we did get back in the game and and I started to think there's an there's a chance we can win it and we did respond a bit in the second half and we did play better but I thought we had we had burnt out really and I didn't think the the, the Giroud sub and taking Walcott off was was the right decision and even if he did want to do that I personally would have put Alexis on the right and Welbs on the left and and and, and retained a bit of width and give Giroud something because we didn't I mean did we even cross the ball to Giroud I, I, don't, I, I can't remember one I don't even think we had a oh. yeah like we had one away we shot I don't think we we didn't Giroud we didn't, no didn't even done. sniff no, did he mate no. and um if you're going to bring on a six foot four centre forward who is an absolutely fantastic link player he's brilliant with his back to goal and he can get and get across his near post and he can get on the end of balls the last thing you want to be doing is asking him to run channels and run in behind and sweat, stretch the fences because he ain't going to do that. So I just felt we took the emphasis out of it and I felt that City were, were lazy, whether they were tired, but they, I thought they could have um, gone for the juggler. But we got a point and, and in the circumstances, it's, it's not good enough, but the, the run we've been on is so bad that it just had to stop. Phil, uh, looking at how you know we managed to scrape a point, I mean, I cast your mind back to December uh, a couple of days after, a few days after we lost to Everton, we went up to City. City weren't in a good r- run of form. They were, you know, fragile. Or did we play City first and then Everton? I can't remember which way round it was, but anyway, we went up to City. You know, we 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 played we played to us we played to a game plan in that first half. You know, sit deep, hit him on the cow, got the goal. You know, second half we didn't come out. We did we really didn't come out for the, to, to 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 assert ourselves. And and City on the other hand did. They not only equalised, but they you know, they, they could see that this was a wounded animal and they went in for the kill. Fast forward to Sunday, you know, we've got City, you know, unsure of themselves. Pep, for the first time, I don't think he knew what to do. Or maybe the players didn't know what to do because usually, you know, he doesn't stop going for that kill. You know, he, he'll, he'll attack, 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 you know. Uh, but on Sunday, it, it, something wasn't quite right within the Man City team in that second half and we just, we just sort of like, you know, we, we, it was like, you know, if we can't win, don't lose. Do you expect um, teams, uh, you know, the home team to actually go for a juggler? Even if you're playing your rivals, if your rivals come into town, do you expect them to actually try and win the game? Or do you think at this point, at this juncture, con- considering our form, you know, a point is probably, you know, fair, fair dues? I, th- I think whoever we're playing, we should always go for the win, especially at home. I mean, that's always the, the attitude that you want. I'm sure that's what the manager wants as well, but... I think in the grand scheme of things, you, you look at, you know, we have, we'd only won two games since since February, and that was against, you know, Lincoln City and Sutton. Mm. Um, we just lost poorly to West Brom the week before. You know, the team's low, the fans are low. I think, to be honest, I thought Man City were quite were quite low on confidence as well. I mean, mm. credit always to to the equaliser to to get that goal back to fight back. You know, I've got no problems with that. I think Mustafi won the won the ball mm. well in the air, you know, to score his goal. But I think I think you're right. For that five or ten minutes afterwards, I think we really should have, you know, got our got our heads together and thought, right, this is if we can get a few shots on goal here they might fold. And there was never really that that intensity from us. We were quite happy to just sort of pass it around a bit. And it goes back to that that friendly atmosphere that we were talking about. It didn't I think both teams were were happy just to sort of take the point and because losing would have been far worse you know I mean if we lost that would have been absolutely disastrous and you know with City had Chelsea the next game as well so I think there was a bit of timidity from both sides but obviously you'd want Arsenal to, to maybe go for it but I, th- I agree with was I think you know losing would have been a lot worse than, than a draw. I want to come on to the systemic issues and more Systemic issues and also more, more so relationships, really. Um, if you look to our midfield, those two, Cochrane and Xhaka, just didn't work. It seems like Cochrane can't play with anybody else but Cthulhu. And we can't find the right partner for Xhaka. If we're, if we're hell-bent, if Wenger's hell-bent on playing this two-man double pivot or whatever it's called, you know. Um, I mean, I, yeah, there are other ways of playing. There are other ways of, of, of protecting and, and really... And, enhancing and highlighting somebody's positives rather than, you know, exposing their their deficiencies. So, you know, Coquelin and, and, and Xhaka really don't work. I mean, what do you think of... Uh, what do you think of the system as it is? In, uh, and, the, uh, you know, and do you think it's a, a case of the system is good, it's the players that can't 
really um, make the most of it, or do you think the system actually doesn't benefit, doesn't help our players? Start with I think I, the, the thing is, I think we've lacked midfield structure since Arteta lost lost his calves. To be honest, yeah. I mean. I mean, it wasn't ideal when he when he first signed, but when he came in, he was a, a real sense of authority, a sense of calmness. You know, he was that nice sort of leader. He wasn't, you know, the typical Vieira leader that we, we'd all like in the side, but he was a nice authoritative figure who just sat in front of the back four, kept the ball ticking, you know. And ever since he sort of lost that battle with fitness, we've, we've struggled, you know, in that midfield. I mean, Coquelin and Cazorla we sort of stumbled across it and, and it worked, you know. It was a nice balance of Cazorla's technical skills and and Coquelin's tenacity, but you know he's injured now as well. So we have to we have to try and move on. And Jack and Coquelin just it just doesn't work. I mean Coquelin, you know there was that thing which really confused me when we signed Jacka. Wenger Wenger spoke about him being a box to box midfielder, and you know even from his days at Basel and, and at Borussia Mönchengladbach, he was he was always that guy to to sit deep, pick up the ball from the back four and, and spray it wide or, or pass through the lines, which is, you know, that, that you know, role of Pirlo or Xabi Alonso, obviously he's not to that level um, yet, but that's, that's you know, comfortably what his role is. And playing him further forward, it just really confused me. And then, you know, three months later, that experiment absolutely bombed. So we, we switched we switched him and Coquelin around and, it's, you know, it just he's exposed all the time. You know, we know he's not the quickest, and it, I think we just we just lack so much structure in in midfield, and and that works from 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 front to back. I mean, sometimes you see Alexis running, trying to press the back four on the keeper, and, and everyone's like thirty yards behind him, you know, with, with covering their men in the space. It's just I don't, you know, you see Tottenham, they press well, you know, they're they're always they've always got Dyer and Wanyama sat just in front of the back four, and then. That gives the creative license for everyone else. And Liverpool, they, they press like maniacs, you know, but they're all on the same wavelength. Chelsea, they've got the 3-4-3. Three, three, they like to get the ball wide and then, you know, let Hazard and, and, and Pedro come in field. I just, we, we haven't really got a style anymore. And I think, obviously, the whole team suffered. But I think Xhaka in particular has been left left out to try, um, particularly. And I think that's why his... He's been picking up so many yellow cards because he's forced to be in these sort of last ditch situations that just don't suit his game. Was what do you reckon to that? I mean, you know, uh, I think Phil's come up with some really good, interesting points there. Uh, you know, um, and, and the thing is, the thing is, it, it really ultimately exposes the defence, and everyone's picking up and having pelt, throwing pelters at the defence. If you go all the way across the back four. You've heard people having a go at Bellerin. You've heard people having a go at Mustafi, uh, Koscielny as well. Gabriel, we all know about. Nacho, that, we, you know, he's dropped off a, pay, a, a percent or two. But, you know, also there's a mitigating circumstances in that we don't cover out. We just don't shield and cover and protect our defence. We leave them to, you know, hang out on, to dry on their own and, you know, to, you know, you know, make, you know, make the best of it as they will. I mean, was, how do you see, do, do you agree with, with, with Phil, with what Phil's saying? Yeah, I think he, he took a massive hammer and hit the nail straight on the head when he was talking about we've got no identity and no... You can't look at an Arsenal side at the moment and, and you can't analyse it and sort of say, yeah, I know what Wenger's trying to achieve here. And I, For the life of me, I love 4 2 3 one and there's so many people that are calling for 4 3 3 but I do genuinely believe, and, and I know we'll talk about the West Ham game, but when you watch the way that that 4-2-3-1 played against West Ham, the amount of times that Meza Ozil was dropping in, and it basically becomes a 4-3-3 scenario. And just because I just want to see some some balance in the midfield and it, it will start, you will then see a better performance from everyone. I mean, Granit Xhaka, like Phil said, definitely, he is a guy that sits in front of the back four with the game in front of him. You don't want him chasing around 20 mile and 100 mile an hour past people, chasing people, trying to make tackles left, right and centre. You don't want him pressing high. You don't want him chasing the game. Just sit him there. Let him have a vision of the game. He can spray the ball 40, 50 yards, left foot. Thank you very much. Good night. So then, to get the best use out of that, you look at your wingers and you say to your wingers, right, if you can retain the width, as soon as Xhaka gets the ball, he's going to look up and we're going to switch this play as quick as anything. We're going to change the whole emphasis of the pitch. And then 
your fullbacks, for me, if your wingers are starting wide, then your fullbacks have got a partner to to become a partner with, not just an isolated. Because what we've seen at Arsenal for a while now, I think, is we've had a, a left winger and a left back, and they don't. They're very, very out of contact. They're not. They're not a partnership. They're not a pairing. And and as due to that, we've we've seen Monreal just be be stuck hung out to dry all season. But I just think in the middle of the park, instead of what Wenger's trying to do is play two DMs sat side by side. He had, he's done it with Xhaka. He's had Coquelin on and he, he's tried all these combinations. But realistically for me, I think you need an, a nice stagger. And between Ozil in the number 10 role and between Xhaka sat deep, you need a link. You need a, an engine and you need someone that can do it, do, do bits at both ends of the pitch. And I just think if you've got the assurance of Xhaka knowing that he's got to sit in front of that back four. He's got to be taking the ball off the centre-backs. He's got to drop in and be the first receiver from the goalkeeper. Then the team works around it. And if we have shape and balance, then you see your full-backs are not getting exposed. Your wingers have got partners to play with. Meza Ozil can drop in and all of a sudden a 4-2-3-1 becomes a 4-3-3. You've got the, the, the rotation of the front three as well. I mean, you don't have to stay wide, but as long as you start wide and then come in, I just think... It, there could be so much better balance here. And we it's difficult talking about formations and that. I mean, 4 2 3 one, we, we get so caught up with it because Mesut Ozil is a, is a number 10. But me, personally, watching Mesut Ozil this whole season, he hasn't played number 10 once. He's, he's been running the channels on the left wing. He's been running in behind. He's been a nine and a half. He's been dropping real deep when we've played two, two DMs because there's no link. He's having to come deeper and deeper to get possession, to try and start things when Alexis ain't up front. And it's just, we're not playing to anyone's strengths, anyone, Xhaka, Ozil, Alexis. I mean, it's just so frustrating. And and as a result, this season has sort of become, I mean, I've heard people say that we need a whole new squad. I just think that's outrageous. I think even people like Coquelin, I just think if you let him... Sit in front of the back four when Jack is not there. He's a, he's a good squad player. He's got something to offer. That's what he was good at. When he was playing alongside Cazorla, he was sat in, doing the dog work, making interceptions, getting the ball, releasing it, and Sanity was there. The link, the quick movement, the quick transition. But Jack has got all that from deep. So the way I saw it before, almost we had two players doing a job that Granite Jack can do on his own now because he's got the passing ability of Sanity, but he's also got the ability to sit in front of the, the back four and, and block off and, and, and block passing lines and make tackles. And then in front of him, you can then release a box-to-box player. Whereas before, with, with Santi was that player in the middle, and it did work. Don't get me wrong, it did work. But I just think now we can go on another level. When you see see players like Verratti and, and people like, I know you love Naby Keita and people like that. I mean, could you imagine him between Xhaka and Ozil? It's just, it's exciting. And I think we've got players at the club like Ox, like Ramsey, like Wilshire, who could do that role. And I mean, El Nenny done it midweek and he can do it to a level and he's a very, very tidy footballer. But I just think we can go on another level and, and have a real genuine box to box midfielder in there that in a balanced side, everyone will improve. And this is what frustrates me because everyone's thrown all our players under a bus this season and Arsene Wenger has put them under an Arctic truck and it, it, everyone else is, is frustrating because we all know, we've all seen every single one of these players at the club, we've seen them perform to their highest level and if you can get them all playing anywhere near that level, we could win the league. There's no two ways about it but there's, there's big, big issues and it's not just this season, it's been a while, mate, but I just think get that, get that balance right, stop the two DM bollocks, I can't stand it, I really, really can't stand it and, and when you see players knowing what they're doing, the centre-back's more comfortable, we've got a spine and a structure, and we can play and move around that. And then the ball starts moving quicker, and we are a very, very different team. And that's where Wenger ball comes from, isn't it? Let me put this guy to you guys. Um, Phil, come first, and then... <clears throat> come first. Go first. And then, um, Warren, you can come in if you want to answer this as well. Phil, you mentioned um, Arteta and, Sim- and, and how... It- Possibly, you know, we have a similar player in, in Xhaka, who you, you said was similar to Pirlo and Alonso. They're all kind of in the same kind of school as of the number sixes or the registers or the quarterback, whatever term you want to put on it. If you remember Pirlo at Juventus, first he had Mikizio and it might have been Pogba, and then he had 
um, Vidal and Pogba playing either side of him, doing the dog's work for him. Um, you know, uh, Pogba was allowed the freedom of the left-hand side of that free to run up and down and do his stuff. Do you, you know, when I look at Bayern Munich, Alonso's sitting deep, he's got Vidal, and he's got, who else is it? I think it's Thiago that kind of... Yeah, does, Thiago. He, yeah. He's kind of the, the mix of the 10 and the 8 kind of thing, you know, depending on when, when they've got the ball and when they haven't got the ball. So where I... This is where I think we can use... We don't necessarily... I don't really want to see Ozil in our defend, in our defensive third because he's not really... He's not really that very... He's not very effective, you know? He's not really the kind of player that can play in that that situation where you can drop in from a number 10 as a number 8 or a number 4, whatever you want to call it, and help defensively as well as offensively. You know, Thiago, for me, that kind of player, that kind of player would do really well in this kind of system. And then you can leave, you, then you can use Ozil maybe further up in a, 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 at the tip of the diamond, you know, maybe, or, you know, and then they have the two strikers up front or, you know, and they split and Ozil's, you know, in the spaces and doing his stuff. You know, I just, I want to see Ozil further up the field is what I'm saying. You know, there's statistics that suggest that, you know, he's one of the best at pressing the ball high. You know, he's one of the best either in the squad or in the league at actually, you know, recovering, recovering the ball and pressing the ball high. So I don't really want to see him in that defensive third. And that's why I, that 4 2 3 1, if we're going to play it, we don't have, I don't think the players currently that work in that system. You know? How, how, how do you see it, Phil? Look, I, I agree with you. Ideally, you want, you want Ozil doing damage in, in the final third. I mean, that's, that's where he's most productive. That's where he can do most damage. That's, that's not a surprise to anyone. But I do think he likes this free role where he, where he can sort of wander left, wander right, maybe come deep and, and try and affect the game from there. But it, it all depends on what system you want to play. I mean, you, you spoke about um, Juve and Bayern and you, you hit it like perfectly when you said they had that one sort of the, 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 the he's, I don't know how to, it's like that. He, you've got Alonso and Pirlo in the middle who are just spraying the ball wide and then you've got the energy and the, and the technical quality beside them. But that's in a 4-3-3. So I agree. I think you referenced Thiago. I think Cazorla has the potential to be that player for us. I mean, we've seen Jacker and Cazorla work a few times. I, don't, I can't remember against Watford. Yeah. Um, that's when we sort of saw it for yeah. the first time. And I think that, that was a nice balance. Mm. Um, I think I agree. I want Ozil further forward, but I don't. I don't actually mind him coming coming deep because then he makes space, you know, because someone's going to have to follow him, um, whether that's a defensive midfielder or a centre half, you know. But I think it, it all just depends on how we want to play. And of late, there just hasn't really been, as we mentioned earlier, there hasn't really been a, a distinct style that we can. That we can say, oh, Arsenal are gonna are gonna line up like this and they're gonna play like this, you know. Whether we we look to to Ramsey to come in and, and play that role, whether we look to or say Chamberlain, I don't know, or whether we look to the transfer market, it's it's a difficult one. But for now, we're gonna have to work with what we've got, and I think for me, Ramsey can play that role to give Özil a bit more license to stay forward, but whether he can be relied on. You know, with his injuries and his inconsistency is is another question. Let's move on to. Oh, sorry. Was did you want to come back? Sorry, did you want to answer? No, it's fine, mate. It's fine. We'll we'll move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, you know, so there there was obviously issues, systemic issues in the midfield at West Ham. You come to sorry, not at West Ham City. You come to the West Ham game. He's slotted in. um, He's taken out Cochrane, and he's put in um, Elneny. And we, to all intents and purposes, look like a bit more of a unit. You know, there's a, there's a tweet from somebody, I can't remember his name, uh, one clip from Sunday where Xhaka is all on his own. There's no one around him, no one to pass to. Then beside that is another clip of Xhaka on Wednesday. He's got Ozu in the vicinity. He's got Oneni in the vicinity. He's obviously got his fullbacks in the vicinity. There seems to be more cohesion, more options, no more passing lanes. You know, just, just, uh, you know, the a structure that everybody seemed to know what they were doing. Obviously, you know, we have to take into account that West Ham weren't very good at all. It was, you know, um, but was I going to start with you? I mean, were you a lot? More, did you see reasons to be encouraged by you know the, the setup, the way we played, the cohesion on Wednesday? From what I've seen for, for the last sort of eighteen months to two years, yes. But 
I've seen snapshots of us mm. performing like this previously, and and then he goes back to the same old, yeah, same old frustrating situation. And I, I just thought we did have a game plan. And West Ham were poor, but we 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 had more in the midfield. Jacker did sit, he did sit, and he did distribute. And the, the centre backs were very comfortable on the ball. The ball was moving beautifully, and we, we I just thought that we looked so so much better. And there was an obvious plan to to switch the ball. Often, and and Jacka, his boot is a wand, and he was doing it with left and right foot, and did Walcott he, was just hugging the touchline. Did Sorry, he? Mate. Did he? Did he play a hundred passes or something? Is that, is that the right stat? Yeah, well, yeah. He, he he's done it on he's done it on a few occasions, mm. Jacka. I think three or four occasions for Arsenal in the midfield, and and that's the quality he's got. And when you do sit him in there and allow him to be the dictator and play the ball, the the, the highest um, pass combination was Jacka through to Özil, which is. There's 29 passes he completed into Meza Ozil. That's exactly what you want to see for your midfield. And and that man in between, the link man, the, the balance was right because they weren't flat. They weren't side by side. Jacker had a defined role. He weren't chasing play. He was just in there deep and he knew what to do. And and they, Noble's not a bad player, is he? But uh, West Ham weren't anywhere near at their best. But the two midfielders just got, they just got dominated. And, and I liked the way that we, we created the space for Ozil. We kept staying wide and, and in the first half, I thought we were just uh, not quite clicking in the final third. I thought Welbs was not quite on it. Sanchez and Elneny. Elneny didn't really offer anything going forward. And Alexis was a bit hit and miss. And he was losing possession a bit. And Theo should have had the penalty, shouldn't he? And yeah. uh, that, was an, that was a bloody yeah. shocking decision. Nacho's Nat- one as well was absolutely yeah. abhorrent. Yeah, oh, that one was absolutely astonishing as well. Right at the end, he was terrible, Atkinson. But in the first half, do you know what? For the first time in a long time, I was watching the game and and normally at home, if, especially against a lesser team, if we ain't scored and we ain't created chances, because so, so often at the Emirates, we very rarely have proper chances at home in the first half. And we, and I normally get quite agitated and I get wound up about it. But I was actually surprisingly relaxed considering the run of form we're on. And, that, and I just I was just watching it thinking, yeah, we, we're doing the right things here. And, and as soon as, as Welbs and Alexis click, and as soon as... Moel Nani can can start progressing through the pitch and and, and we can get the, get him higher up and we, we'll start creating a lot more chances and had we got the penalty for the Theo one earlier and, and gone one 0 up much earlier I think it could have been even more but in the second half we came out and, and we started turning it on a bit more and Alexis was getting on his game and and Wells was creating chances and and things were happening a bit more but I was pleased with the performance and I was pleased with the balance of the midfield too and. And it, it's, it's, it's just, it was just nice to see a bit of structure and a bit of, um, bit of identity. And I could see the way we were trying to approach the game with the long diagonals and everyone just looked comfortable. And that, that's the biggest compliment you can say for, because for a long, long time, we ain't looked solid. We ain't looked comfortable and we ain't looked like we've had a plan. But I bought into that midweek and it, I must admit, it made me smile a bit because it's been a long time since I've enjoyed a game of football. But it relaxed me and I could actually enjoy it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Phil um, was, as alluded to, Alexis and Welbeck. And I suppose in the second half where Alexis started to play a bit more centrally, and maybe I've heard that, I, I didn't see it much myself, but I heard that Welbeck might have switched to the left. I mean, I've been calling, we've, I mean, I'm sure you've all been calling for it. You know, we saw it at West Brom, he started um, Welbeck up front, and he had Alexis on the left against Man City. Massive, massive mistake not to put um, Welbeck on... on um, Navas gave them the initiative, you know, and then he started again, you know, Welbeck up front with Alexis. Um, and I do, and I thought to myself, I sat back and I wondered, is there any, is there any evidence to this thing about his, he's got degenerative knees, you know, if he has got degenerative knees, he's got a chronic knee problem or knee problems, you know, we're going to have to manage how we play him and therefore we can't play him two times a week, you know, possibly can't start him on the wing <clears throat> or can't have him playing extensively on the wing because, you know, I don't know um, what kind of knee problem he's got, but, you know, maybe we just have to manage his minutes and make sure that, you know, you know, he, he doesn't overexert himself. I suppose up front, he's not as good as he is on the left. This is why I've, I just was always perplexed why Wenger didn't switch him. But um, there's also, I suppose, the thing of rustiness. He's just coming back when, man, you know, he's, he's easing his way back. I mean, how did you see the relationship between Alexis and, uh, and Welbeck over these past few weeks. And, 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 and then again on Wednesday night when, you know, Alexis came into the middle a lot more, then he started to, 
you know, you saw his vision, his artistry, you know, he was pinging balls, you know, ping, pinging cheeky little ball through balls here, there and everywhere. I mean, how did you see that? I think naturally, I think Welbeck and Alexis work a lot, a lot better than Alexis and Giroud. I mean, Welbeck offers, you know, some running in behind, some some physical strength as well. And the thing is, I I, I would put Welbeck on the left as, as well with Alexis up front because I think Alexis on the left, he, you make him into the thing that he hates most, which is predictable. I mean, he likes to be that guy that picks the ball up on the edge of the box, you know, control it in an instant and then and spin. You know, there's we've seen it so many times this season. We've seen it at Swansea, we've seen it at United. That first yard, he knows someone's behind him, just a little flick around the corner and he's gone. That's what he likes to do. He likes to deceive defenders, make that little space and then see what he can do. Maybe crack off a shot, you know, find someone running from deep. And I think he's a lot, you know, he works hard. There's no doubt that he works hard. You know, he's, he's tenacious. We've seen that from from his first game here. But I think Welbeck is a lot more adequate at covering his fullback. So so naturally for me, I think Welbeck suits the left a lot more in our current system. I know Alexis has played on the left for us for, for most of his career. But I think there is something in 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 his knees, to be honest. I think that... And you have to be careful with anyone coming back from a long-term injury, but Warbeck's had two cruciate ligament injuries in two years, which is is terrible luck. Mm. Um, so we need to be careful anyway. But I think you know, I thought it was quite common knowledge that he suffered with this with this problem about having extra fluid in the knees. Just for, I, I um, heard about it recently, like you know that he might have had a chronic problem. I didn't know this. Yeah, was... I think it's it's called Osgood Schlatter. Um, you know, it's it's quite common in when. In teenage boys who play a lot of sport, um, it's when sort of fluid uh, just surrounds itself on the joint, which makes running very painful. So um, I mean, do, they, do they drain it or how do they get rid? I mean, how does? I don't think it? it. You can't drain it. I think you know. I had a few mates at, at school that had it, and I think you just have to sort of take it easy until the the fluid finds its way out into the rest of the joint um, instead of sort of colluding in one area. Um, you know, which is which is tough enough. Um, to deal with I don't know if it carries through or how long it carries through into adulthood um, but you know there's definitely a, a management a management plan that we have to be be wary of there so did he um, have this did he have this problem when he was a child like as a teenager going going through the, the youth system or is it something that we've just noticed now no I think I think it's been spoken about when he was at United as well oh, okay yeah um, I mean look we always we always have to be careful with long-term injuries but I don't think that helps, um, but I do agree that that Welbeck he could do more on the left. I mean, um, than he does up front because I don't think his link play is that that great with his back to goal. Um, I don't think he has that sort of dynamism that Alexis has to to beat a player, you know, in tight areas. I don't think he's he's got really the shot. You know, Alexis can can shoot from range with with such little back lift, and it, it's incredible. I mean, you see the goal against Villa in the FA Cup final. Um, you know that, that was just incredible. Um, so I would have, I am an advocate for for switching those two around. But for the last three games, we just haven't been doing it. So I don't know whether there's something in that in the long term, or maybe he's just trying to get Wells back to fitness. But yeah, that's that's how I see things really. Was I know you've seen it as well as me. You know those the, the, them two there. Um, yeah. You know, it's just it's puzzling, right? Hundred percent. I find it infuriating, mate. But it's just a, it's just um, another little thing I can add to the book of things I found infuriating over the last few years. <laughs> there, uh, I'm running out of space in my little pad. But yeah, it's um, I, I can't, I can't understand it. I, I really can't. I think Danny Welbeck, as much as he may want to be a centre forward, and and I'd compare it, funnily enough, to Theo Walcott because. Both of them have got the ability to play up front and they can do a job up front and they will get goals and they do do things, but they're both far more effective for me from wider areas coming onto the game, making the runs in behind, stretching the defences, using their athleticism, using their pace. They're not tricky. They're not like Alexis. And, and, and like Phil said, when you get Alexis down a, down an arrow alley on the left, he never, he never ever goes round his fullback. Never. I, I can't remember the last time I saw him do it for Arsenal. Take a fullback on on the left hand side and get round him. He's constantly coming inside, and and he he does it. He still does it a hell of a lot because he's an unbelievable footballer. But he's so predictable, and and it, when he does come inside, an inverted cross without a big centre forward is almost he's, he's, he's pointless. If you're going, I just think if you're playing a a pacey 
a pacey different type of centre forward. You want to be sort of getting getting to the bar line and cutting it back or, or getting balls in behind for him. But I just think Welds has got the the athleticism and 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 he's far far better coming onto the game rather than being the man that the game comes off of. If you know what I mean. Mm, and yeah. Whether it's it's to do with his, his physical physical situation and things like that, it'd be it'd be going to know that. But there's a reason why Fergie played him left wing in all of United's biggest games because he's like Phil said, he's such a workhorse. He provides a lot of protection, but he's also such a danger because of his athleticism and his size. And, and like you said, G, if you put him up against Navas, there's only one winner. And I think Pep played Navas because he knew that Alexis was playing left wing in it. And it was almost, they had an additional attacker, but he was playing in defence. Like it, they knew that they could get away with that. And I would have thought that Wenger would have reacted to that, even if it was for 10 minutes. Just, just switch him. Just switch him because. I mean, where we saw Alexis up front earlier on in the season, the amount of times that Theo Walcott was able to get into a position at centre-forward and we, we had the rotation and teams couldn't deal with it. Imagine you had Welbs doing that on the other side. You, you, it's just, it would be so hard to deal with, but do you think, I, think, I think we all see it apart from Arsene, mate. Do you, think, though, do you think, though, he's looking at moments like um, the Everton game last season where he played Welbeck up front or... Man United game a couple of years ago when we went up there for the uh, FA Cup mm. game, you know, and played him up front, and even to an extent, I know the, um, the, the Monaco game where he missed a hat full of chances, he was pretty sharp in getting on to them, you know, yeah. he, you know, he he can go in, he can go in behind, and even Tottenham last season, was it Tottenham last season we played him up front and he was running the channels, pulling Vertonghen or whoever it was out wide and making space for Ramsey to come in the middle. Do you think? Do you think? Probably, possibly, that's why he he's trying Welbeck up front rather than, and then obviously after a while, maybe he's you know after 50 minutes or so, you know, he switches Alexis over to to front because obviously, again, you said it in the past was you know switching Alexis to the to the front affects affects Ozil's game. Of course, it does. It, they're in the same, they're working in the same space, aren't they? Exactly. They they become a partnership higher up the pitch, and I did think against West Ham, like I, like I was saying, I thought in the first half we were struggling to create that partnership in, between the front three. And, and I'd also include, when Alexis is sent forward, I'd also include Walcott into that because Ozil, Alexis and Walcott had a really good thing going on. And Awobi was given the freedom, the whole freedom of the pitch pretty much, weren't he? And yeah. um, we, we, we was, obviously, Monreal was being a bit exposed there still. But I just think with Welbeck, it'd give a bit more protection and still give that creative hub that we created and, and you've got, like you said, the, the partnership of Alexis and, and Meza and Ozil will, he's a world class footballer and he will just go where the space is. Mm. That's what he does. He, he will just, the amount of times I saw him midweek just serenely drift into a space. He, he, and he finds the ball and he's in 10 yards and he's on the edge of their box between the lines and you think, has he got there and got the time to turn and get the ball? And then you think, oh, that's bad defending. But when you watch him, He's a magician, mate. He really is. He, it's almost if you close your eyes, he's gone. He's gone into another space and he just gets in there, picks the ball up, does nothing flashy, moves it on. And then that is what Meza Ozil was brilliant at. And when he's got Alexis there with him, it does change his game a bit. And, and I always, I have argued in the past that maybe it ain't always for the best because he's forcing him to, mm. to run channels and he's forcing him to run beyond when really I want to see him as a chief creator. But, Alexis getting the ball in that area, but I do think if Welbs was out on the left, we might not see Ozil as wide. Left, yeah. Exactly, and then we might see more of a, a, a partnership in the middle of the park, and you might almost have two creative hubs, and then you've got your two wide attackers running into them spaces vacated by Alexis, and I think we could be a bloody dangerous football team, and the more I talk about it, the more it winds me up, because I think <laughs> this has been the biggest waste of a season with the ability of the players we've got, we've gone out in the summer, signed three captains. I mean, Lucas Perez is a fantastic squad player and we've been so poor. You've got people like Giroud. I mean, Giroud's got the best goal per minute in the Premier League this season and we've been shy. And he's, he's, do you know what I mean? He's contributing. And if we actually had a bit of balance, we would have won the league. I don't care what anyone says. We could have easily won the league and we should have won the league last season. And this season, we went out and got the personnel to really, really improve us. We had bloody Flamini last year and we should have won the league. And we got Xhaka in, Mustafi, people like Lucas Perez, another good squad player. We'd done the switch, got Alexis up front, and all of a sudden, we bollocks it. And, and we look like a pub team. And we've won two games. Now we beat West Ham, but we had only beat Sutton and Lincoln. 
and we had just completely capitulated, got banged by Bayern, embarrassed in Europe again. It's just painful, mate. It, it's just painful because I look at our squad and people now, there's a lot of people and I don't blame them because we've been terrible for so long, but they're questioning every single one of these players and I'd, I'd argue a point for every single one of them players in that squad and I think every single one is good enough to be at Arsenal Football Club. I think 100% we could improve on some areas, but we could definitely be winning a league with this squad, in my opinion. And it's just, it's just sad. It's just sad that this season's gone like this for me because I, I genuinely did have really high expectations and rightly so because we've got some cracking players, but it's fell on its arse a bit and, and none of the combinations have come off and just something ain't right, is it? Yeah, mate, that's why I wonder, is it the players? Is it the system or is it the tactics? You know, he's gone out, like you said, he's bought some really good players both first team and, you know, squaddies, you know, to improve the, the, the squad as a whole. I think everyone to a man, Jack, said at the beginning of the season, this was a pretty good squad. It was one of the best he's actually assembled for some time. And yet, you know, um, by November, we're treading water. He's had to bring in Giroud to switch up because we'd been found out playing um, um, Alexis up front. We'd been found out. That's why he brought in Giroud, you know, and that's why Giroud actually, we changed it up a bit. Giroud went on a bit of a scoring run tailed off a bit we switched it up again I mean I just wonder I don't know Phil is it is it the players is it the system or is it is it the tactics or is it all free if it, I mean if it's all free then we're, we're buying the wrong players if it's all free then we're using the wrong system and if it's the tactics well we, well, we don't need to say anymore do I <laughs> no, I think at the end of the day all, all three there are factors you know I think there's definitely a negligence in terms of our preparation and our and our tactical game. I think take a look at the the Premier League top five at the moment, and each side has a clear structure, a clear system that they abide to, and we just we just don't really have that at the moment. But I also feel that the, some players have underperformed this year, um, not consistently, but just games here and there. They add up, you know mistakes, you know, Mustafi's made a few mistakes, even though he's a new player, he's done well, um, especially before he got injured, I thought he was he was really good alongside Koscielny, but, you know, he's made mistakes, Theo's had barren runs, you know, Iwobi's tailed off a bit, you know, it's, it's normal, he's, he's a young player, you know, Ozil tailed off for a bit as well, whether that's down to Alexis, you know, taking up his, his room on the pitch, I don't know, but I think I agree with Waz, I thought we signed three three captains, three Leaders, I thought they were really good additions. Xhaka, young player, but a lot of experience both domestically and internationally. Mustafi, the same. Perez, slightly more experienced, but a real killer instinct in that final third, which I think we lacked a lot last year. Um, so I was really excited as well, but it's, it just hasn't it hasn't gone as planned. And I think I think everyone has to has a role to to play and in, and if that's the case everyone has to take part of the blame as well so I think it's it's difficult to just put the put the blame on the manager for this one mm. uh, let's move on uh, to a couple of things I don't know if you what if you read um, uh, Statsbomb's uh, defence versus attack piece this week but he basically said um, we're conceding less shots on goal but the actual Goals we actually we're actually conceding, the, the actual shots we are conceding are actually better quality. The opposition are actually making better quality chances. So it seems to me maybe that they're instead of pay, taking pot shots and long distance shots, you know, outside here and you know having a go, they're actually being able to work their way into central or really good striking positions. And if you look at our defense, uh, the, the goals that we've been conceding, a lot of them have actually come from within the twelve yard box. And it makes me wonder, um, you know, how do we arrest that? Uh, Phil, I'm going to come to you first and then I'll speak to Woz. Well, as we were talking about earlier, I think it's just it's just about how we how we choose to play. I mean, the teams this season, they continue to show that we can be caught on the break. I mean, we play a very, a very high line, which often sees our fullbacks pushed on in, in wide areas, almost almost as wingers which leaves our two centre-backs and maybe one defensive midfielder, whether that's, you know, Jack or Coquelin, I don't know. But that leaves lots of room down the wing, and our passing has been very passive. You know, we we have these technically gifted players who can you can sort of play that possession-based game, but we don't, we don't really seem to be at teams from the off. You know, we seem to pass it around, you know, without, without any real incision. And this leaves 
you know, teams the perfect opportunity. I mean, we saw it at West Brom the other week. When have they ever been a counter-attacking side? Never. But we, they put James McLean on one wing, Nasser Chadley on the other, stuck Rondon up front, and then they just they just took advantage. You know, in that first half, they caught us three or four times. You know, which is which is not good enough. I mean, this is West Brom. They've got. Darren Fletcher and, and James Morrison and Chris Brunt, who who are slow players and they manage to catch us on the break. And it's just, we leave people exposed. And, you know, the less people we have in defence, it obviously, it, it, leaves gap in our, it leaves gaps in our penalty box for those high quality shots. So, again, it's just down to that structure. I mean, on Wednesday against West Ham, we we limited West Ham to to only real chances. I mean, we, Martinez made that, that one save from Lanzini. Um, and granted, they didn't offer a lot, but we just looked so much more secure um, at the back. And there was just more balance there when, when Bellerin went, when Real stayed, you know, and, and as Woz was talking about earlier, there was that link man uh, with El Neni who could go forward, but also drop deep when we were defending as well. So it's a difficult one, but I do think ultimately it's down to that structure. And too, too many times this season, we just haven't got it right. And we've left ourselves so exposed which is where those those high quality chances are coming from. Uh, was um, stats when also talked about our attack, saying that um, once again we are we're not so great at creating chances or, or so really high quality chances. But you know, having said that, Alexis is on eighteen. Ozil's got double figures now in the league this season. We've got uh, Walcott has got what ten, eleven now. You got I don't know in the league. I think he's in double figures as well, isn't he? Mm, yeah, yeah, he's got yeah, yeah. double figures, nineteen in all comps. Yeah, as well, so. yeah. So for me, I mean, even though you know we're we've kind of there's been a reduction in our you know uh, our XG or whatever you want to call it. I don't really, I've never really, I don't really have much issues with us going forward because I know that when we click, we can click. I mean, we don't see it very often, but I don't think that really is is the problem for us. But um, you know, in defence, I mean, how do, how do we arrest this kind of thing? from happening again I mean are you happy with seeing Xhaka Elneny um, and Ozu again on Monday for the Palace game I mean do you think that's a combination that we can see going forward I mean we might see Ramsey coming in we might see Oxford Zambian coming in but we definitely need a bit more structure as you both have alluded to you know which means that we're suppressing the amount of high quality shots that we're conceding and also we're allowing our front players our creative players to flourish mm. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> With regards to that midfield, I just think the the, the way the midfield is utilised rather than the, the individuals selected in that midfield is what's going to make the difference. And and like I said, against West Ham, it wasn't a flat two. It was more of a staggered and there was a link and we had a, the, the three actually worked as a three instead of what we what I was saying earlier about seeing with Coquelin and Xhaka as a flat two, getting caught out one stays, one goes, both go, both stay. It's, it's just all over the shop. And, and you could actually see that the, the difference it makes, it allows us to move the ball a lot quicker through the lines. It creates the space. It allows us to get the ball into the final third much faster. We've got the long switches with the width provided. And like Phil said brilliantly, when Bellerin goes, Monreal's got to stay and vice versa. We can't have this huge, huge reliance on fullbacks that Wenger's turned to for the last 18 months, which has broke my heart because the amount of times I've seen you look up and you've got, you've got Meza Ozil, one of the most creative, best footballers in the world. And, and we're relying on our fullbacks to provide us any sort of width. And I know other teams do do it, but when you've got wingers like we've got, if Alexis just stays wide and isolates his fullback, they're in trouble. It's simple as that. And I just think the, the whole balance of the team is far, far superior when we're not a cluster. And I think that is the reason why we haven't created as many chances, because we do, we, we stifle ourselves, I think. We stifle ourselves. We got, especially in the first half of the season, we got, Sanchez dropping deep, we've got Ozil in there, we've got Awobi coming in there, we've got two DMs, so how are we going to create the chance? The only outlet we had was Theo, and that was and that was a lot of the time was the, how we got the goals, his movement and Bellerin. And, but I just think if we open the game out, Arsenal at their very best move the ball quicker than any team out there, they do, they really do, and, and it, it is easy, we've got the players to do that and the players to achieve that, and when we are moving the ball fast and we create chances at a canter, we really can. And in second half against West Ham, we, we just started. I mean, that, that ball from Alexis when you had Bellerin, didn't you? Pop up out of nowhere yeah. in the box. Yeah. And that's, 
that's the kind of that's the kind of frightening things we can do to teams when we retain our width and we have balance and it was just nice to see but I want to see a continuation of that and we've we've had previous games where we've played well and and done the right things but it's all fell on its head and last year we had United didn't we and then we had Chelsea this year and everyone said yeah 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 so and then next thing you know he he just loses the plot again and we don't seem to get the best out of it but the the, the issue is I, I I don't want to blame players because I know what these players can do and I, I've got my conceptions about what formations or what positions they should play in. But I just think if you get the team right, the balance and, and the way we're playing right, and I know we keep talking about it, but it is vitally important in this day and age because I think a few years ago, football was less tactical and more explosive. You, if you had the best players, you could take you could rely on them. But now teams, teams find you out. They're intelligent. Everyone's fit as a fiddle. They're drilled. They know what they're doing. They know how to stop teams. And unless you come up with bright ideas, nothing will happen, no matter who you've got. And I was pleased with our performance against West Ham. And, and, and that midfield trio, it probably could be the same players. But definitely, I just want to see a stagger. I want to see Jacker deep. And El Nenny between, for me, is, is, is solid. He, he's not, you know, I'm not his, <laughs> his biggest fan in the world. Mm. I, can, I can see what he does and I can see why people like him. But... I don't trust him defensively. I think he gets yeah. bypassed quite often yeah. and he's and he's he's not great in the final yeah. third. But for certain games you've got players like Ox. We saw him come in for a few games explosive. Aaron Ramsey, for me, is a natural number eight. He's a he's a box to box midfielder who will eat all the ground on the pitch. He can get back and defend. There's been far too often lately we ain't seen consistency from him, but he hasn't played in a balanced team and it's like a lot of these players. You will see the best of Aaron Ramsey, you will see the best of Ox, you will see the best of all these players, if we play with balance and that's something that has to happen and it did happen against West Ham and in the end we made light work of a, yes, a poor team, but it was nice to see and hopefully we go to Palace and do a similar thing because they're going to be a threat, they're going to do um, like Phil said, what West Brom done and, and they went with a, the counter-attack in with the big man and the two wide men Palace will probably do that with Benteke, Zaha and Townsend, so if, if we can counteract that and we become the danger and we're the front footed team with the emphasis and we've got the, the width and we've got the strong the strong spine and the strong middle of the park, we'll we'll comfortably win that game. But it's Arsene Wenger and I don't know what he's gonna do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Phil it's coming over to you. I mean let's kinda of leave the podcast on a sort of a, on a high if you want. I mean, or looking forward or looking on the brighter side. Do you feel now with Liverpool's travails, I mean, I know they beat Everton, but they, they could only draw against Bournemouth and people are wondering now whether the wheels are kind of coming off and Man United can't seem to win for love nor money. Do you think that we now have given ourselves a chance of actually getting into that top four position? Do you think that the, you know, the other two teams or the other three teams ahead of us, you know, we can, we can catch them and we can overtake them basically? I think we're we're always in a chance of of getting top four because I mean we've done it every year since since Wenger's been here. Um, I I think Liverpool missed a really good chance to to get into that top four with with their recent results and and now they've missed Lalana for a few weeks and Mane's out for the season now, which is a a massive blow for them because I don't think they've won won a game without him, have they? Yeah, so, no, yeah, yeah. So I think they're going to fall away. Um, I always thought they would. Actually, because there's no way you can maintain a pressing game like that all season. You know, with the with the squad they've got, it's it's just not good enough across across the board. So, but I think I think Tottenham and Chelsea are certainties to get in there. They just look, you know, they've they've all got injuries. You know, Tottenham were missing Harry Kane, Lloris, Wanyama, and they still managed to to get a result the other day. So that is the prime example of how a system. Um, outweighs the technical quality um, and it's the same with Chelsea I mean obviously they've got brilliant players but Victor Moses like, he's doing the job at right back but he's he's the, the prime beneficiary of, of, a, of a good system and a well drilled team so those two are, are assured to get into the top four I think um, from there on it's, it's, just, it's a free for all really I mean the thing that I worry about with Arsenal is that we've got we have to go to White Hart Lane which we've never really looked convincing there of late. Um, we have United to play and, and as bad as they're they're playing they can't they can't buy a win. You know, they 
it's Mourinho. You know, he always manages to do a number on Wenger, um, especially at our place. He'll just nullify the game, and they've they've got the quality to hurt us. You know, if they if they need to, they've got Pogba's fit again now. Ibrahimovic is back. They've got Martial, Mkhitaryan, and they've got the players to to hurt us. And then we've got Everton, who who are you know they won't challenge for the top four, but they're still a good side. And Kuman is the same as Mourinho. They always he always finds a way to to nullify us. I mean, especially with Southampton, they they used to beat us every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Stoke, you know, we still have to go there. So it's it, it all depends on on those games, really. I think Palace will, will not be easy. Neither will Middlesbrough because you know they're fighting for their lives. But I think we have enough. We have enough to beat them. But it all depends on those on those games. And I'm not feeling too confident at the moment. But that could all change in a week. So. For now, I've, I've got us finishing outside the top four, but a win at Palace, you know, and, and spirits are high again. So it's fine margins. It, you know, it always is at this time of the year. You've mentioned the importance of squad players <clears throat> in other teams. And obviously, Koscielny's out with an Achilles. He's come back to his really ugly head at the end. And we've, we've had to draft in Gabriel. I mean, how impressive you, were you with Gabriel's performances at, at centre-half? Well, I, I was actually... I thought he was so composed um, against West Ham in particular. Um, I saw Koscielny come off against City at half time, mm. and I was thinking, "Oh, here we go," because we saw what happened against Bayern twice, you know, and we just conceded the goal. And I thought the floodgates were open, to be honest. But um, you know, he's he's an aggressive defender, but he added a real a real calmness to his game, um, especially against West Ham. You know, Andy Carroll, you can you can think what you want about his technical quality and. You know, he's, he's a bit, bit awkward, you know, on the ball, he's a bit awkward, but at the end of the day, he's a handful. And Gabriel's not the tallest, not the tallest player. Um, but I thought he, his, his passing was good. His, you know, his line, he always kept the shape with, with, with Mustafi and Monreal on his side. No, I, th- I there was one crunching tackle in particular that made me gasp a bit because I thought, oh God, he's going to go straight through the back of him here. But, no, he won the ball fair and square, and he made another brilliant challenge on the touchline, actually. So, I was impressed. I mean, he's not he's not up to the standard of of Koscielny, um, but it's nice to know that we can we can rely on these guys because I thought Rob Holding hmm. uh, can find himself quite unfortunate not to be given a a chance because whenever he's he's played, he's done really well. But you know, if Gabriel has managed to find a new sort of composed side to his game, then then I'm all for it. Then he can keep his place for Palace. I've got no problems with that. What was over to you? I just want to go back to you on the uh, top four chances. I mean, how do you see it? You're a gambling man. You do your rackers and whatnot. You know, always trying to get me to bet on your uh, odd sites that you follow. So, you're a gambling man. What do you reckon? You feeling I good? Be putting, I don't think I'll be putting my money on us, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, I just don't see how we can go from how poor we've been this season. We're well, saying that he's done it in the past and he? he's turned it out of nowhere, but. It was worrying. The thing that worried me were the comments coming out of the club when they were saying about how the financially top four isn't as important as it used to be. And with the TV deal and that, it's not as imperative anymore, which is absolute bollocks because the Champions League for me is the competition that if you want to have the best players, if you want to be the best clubs, you've got to be in it. And you not just be in it, you've got to get past the last 16 for, for one bloody chart of time. Do you know what I mean? It's, mm. it's, in, it's entirely frustrating and, and, well, the way Phil analyses the games, when he when you're sitting there and listening to him talk about it, you're thinking, eh, 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 we're in trouble here. And <laughs> I just don't know what's going to go. Yeah. But I just want to take it one game at a time. I want to see us go to Palace, do a job, get out of there, spend our spend our Easter in the flipping lovely place that is Middlesbrough. <laughs> I don't know why they've decided to put it on Easter Monday, but <laughs> thank you very much yeah. to uh, TV companies. But yeah, it's just I just hope that. We can get these points and, and, and just keep ticking over, really, because not just for the Premier League, we need to, to, to get a bit of momentum going into the City game at Wembley because if our tails are up and we, and we are starting to perform well and he does get a balanced team and he picks the same same sort of line-up and, we, and we, we stay strong and do get a run going, I fancy us against City because we were nowhere near our best and, to be fair, they weren't either, but it's, 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 it would be an exciting game and it's always a chance of going to a cup final. But, yeah, I'm not... Not um, not overly confident on top four. And just quickly want to touch on Gabriel. Mm. I, I mean, when I, f- I remember I first watching, the first time I saw him live, I was up at St James's Park, and I remember the ball. He was running over to to, to go and tackle a geezer on the touchline, and he, he he was about three yards to the ball first, and he 
absolutely walloped it as far up in the stand as he could. <laughs> and then I thought, as soon as I saw that, I thought, fucking hell, this guy, he's, he's a nutter. He's an, he's an absolute nutter and he's a proper centre back and he's so erratic and he was so, but do you know what he reminds me of so much? He reminds me of Koscielny when he first signed yeah. for Arsenal. He, he was lightweight. Mm. He was erratic. Mm. He was overzealous. Uh, yeah. Exactly. You yeah. couldn't you couldn't trust him with the ball. You looked at him and you thought, yeah, this geezer. You can see he's come from the French league too. But then all of a sudden, after a couple of years in English football, he learnt his trade. He learnt the way to play. He developed himself mentally as a Premier League footballer and and physically as well. And you look at a photo of him when he first joined to now, of course, and you look at the same as Gabriel. Gabriel's beefing up and he's becoming a man. He's becoming a, a footballing man. And I'm glad he's got his opportunity. And I'm obviously not glad that the reason he's got it is because Koss is injured. But I'm a big, big fan of Gabriel. And I do really think he could follow a similar path to Koscielny and, and maybe peak around the age of 27, 20. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's still, you forget, he's still quite young. And probably because of the way he looks. He looks like he's, he's, he's had a few years on him, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I really like, I really, really do like Gabriel. And it was nice to see the calm inside of his game that obviously will develop over time, but he's got that aggressiveness that strikers don't like playing against. They don't, they don't like defenders like that. I mean, but he can also read the game well. And I was very, very pleased with him and I'm, I'm glad he's got his chance and hopefully he continues to improve. And, and him and Mustafi, if, if Koss is out for, a period of time can forge a, a decent partnership. And, and the thing is also, they all, I mean, Martinez, we haven't really touched on Martinez, but, you know, people now are wondering whether he could stake a claim for the number one spot. But the thing about that back five is they're all Spanish speakers, so that can only help in terms of, you know, in, you know, um, communications, where to stand, you know, the line, blah, blah, blah. I remember Peter Cech saying that he had to speak like three or four different languages, you know, when he first came, you know, to, to get his point across to, to, to his back, you know, to his defenders where he wanted him to be and so on and so forth. So, you know, if they all, all speak in a common tongue, then it's only going to help the situation. Um, what I wanted to ask you guys, I just, it just came into my mind really was, um, last night, um, John Cross came out with an article about, uh, the power struggle between Wenger and, and possibly Gazidis. Phil, um, I wanted to bring you in just real quickly. I mean, how do you see that going? I mean, we were led to believe that there's a two-year contract sitting on the table since, you know, last year. Now it seems as though there's a few dissenters, or you know, a couple, or one or two dissenters higher up that are actually questioning whether Wenger should actually sign. And also, maybe, you know, if he does sign, then he should have these caveats. You know, we should insert these clauses like, you know, director of football, change out your coaching staff. You know, let's improve the medical system and training and I think there's more developments going on in the, the, the medical department and the academy and so on and so forth. I mean, how do you see it? Do you think, you know, he said that he's willing to sign. He was ready. He's, he's made, no, he didn't say he's willing to sign. He's made his decision and he'd be, he'll be disclosing it very soon. Now we don't know, you know, we don't know what the situation is. If there was a two year contract, why hasn't he signed it already? I mean, how do you see that whole mysterious behind the scenes kind of chess game playing out? I think it has been, I think it has been very strange to be honest, because usually, um, Arsene and, and Gazidis, they usually, they're well in support of each other. They're on the same page. They, they have no trouble speaking, speaking to the media. You know, they were, they, they acknowledged the tough times, but they were always positive about the future, you know, three or four years ago. Um, I actually like Gazidis as well. I think he's, I think he gets a lot of stick, but I think he's done a good job. Um, he's a likable character. He speaks well. But of late, you can just tell that something's not not quite right with those two. I mean, it, they're not on the same page, and you can tell because you've got Wenger saying one thing in the press conferences. He's like, I want to sign, you know. Well, he's not, he hasn't said I want to sign, but I think the, the intention is clear from his, from his wants, side of things. He said he wants to stay, didn't he? Yeah, so. yeah he, he said he wants to stay. And, you know, whether there is this two-year deal on the, on the table is, remains to be seen, but... The fact that Gazidis, who's usually, as I said before, he's usually comfortable speaking to the media, he has not said a word for the last for the last six months. You know, um, apart from the the fans forum, what was it before City um, when he spoke to to the fans and he said that you know there had to be a catalyst for change. What well, what that meant, I don't know, but you can tell that there's there's a difference of opinion there, and I think regardless. 
of what happens with the manager. There's going to be a shake-up in the, inside the club. I mean, there's we saw Andres Jonker leave with Freddy Umberg for, for Wolfsburg, and there's, there has to be a new academy manager coming in, academy director, so that's one change. Dick Law, transfer negotiator, that could be another change. He's he's rumoured to be off as well, so with, uh, with the club looking for a new sporting director, as but, you said before, the medicine, yeah. medical uh, department. So, you know, there's going to be changes, and whether, I think it's all about finding common ground, whether Arsene wants to be part of those changes or not. It's as simple as that. Was over to you. I mean, you've got to wonder if, 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 Cron- uh, not Cronky, if, uh, Gazidis is one of those that are sort of like, you know, calling for, you know, some clauses to be inserted into his new deal. You wonder how much sway he's going to hold with someone like Cronky, because you know Cronky adores the, the, the ground that, that, uh, Wenger walks on. You know, um, mm. he's not really that bothered about challenging or winning titles or trophies and whatnot. So you wonder is, if it is Gazidis, you know, he hasn't come out in the media, but he's, he's come out to the fans from like Phil said, and he, you know, you've got John Cross and all these guys getting some kind of tenure. So however, it came through to them, they're getting some kind of info, you know, from back channels. I mean, do you feel that he's on shaky ground? I mean, it's a really, it's a political game he's playing. He is very good. You know, um, he's done really well in terms of, well, he's done as well as he could. In my opinion, I think he's done as well as he could in the comms department in terms of he's, you know, he had to wait for the old deals to, to expire, then got us new deals. Obviously, we've been overtaken in that time, but you know, there's only so much you can press for. You can only, there's only so much you can demand in terms of comms deals if you haven't got on field success and we don't have a sugar daddy that's willing to, you know, bankroll us in the way that the uh, Qataris have with, with, with uh, Man City and, you know, and, uh, Ranvich has done with um, Chelsea in the past. How do you see all this? <laughs> it's, it's a really, 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 really weird situation to be in. And I think with Gazidis, I think, like you said, how well he's done with comms, I, I think part of Gazidis' problem is he can see that, like you said, he might have hit a level. And there's only so much he can negotiate now because there's so many other clubs that are getting big stadiums, they're um, investing in a the squad. They're winning trophies. They're, they're, they're challenging for titles. They're up there. They're, they're going to be in the Champions League year in, year out. And, and, and there's a lot of exciting projects going on. And, and Arsenal now, are, are we really that, that appeal, that, 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 that drag and that draw? Because it's becoming painful, really. And I, I think um, Gazidis, in, able for, in order for him to be able to do his job to his maximum potential, like you said, Arsenal have to be a club winning trophies. Now, he's done a fantastic job. And I look at Gazidis and I listen to him and I think he speaks very intelligently. I, I like him. I like the way he approaches things. And I, I, I get the feeling he wants to win. And he knows that in order for him to be able to maximise the potential of this football club and do his job, we have to be winning. And, and he can see that Arsene Wenger at the moment isn't the man to be winning. And all this talk about changing staff and uh, I'm of the belief that you could change the goalkeeping coach, you could change Steve Bold, you could change everything, but I'm not sure Wenger will listen. And I just think he could be the the one man that is not holding his football club back, but he, at the end of the day, the way we're performing on the pitch, we've got the squad to do it, we've got the stadium to do it, we've got the fan base to do it, we've highest match day revenue. We We are a massive club, but we're not acting like one, we're not performing like one. And for me... The money's there for Wenger to spend. He's been backed. He spent a hell of a lot of money last season. He spent £35 million on Xhaka, Mustafi come in. Perry, I mean, £17 million on Perez was a pot shot, really, wasn't it? I mean, mm. it was just a, it's a kind of deal that we wouldn't normally be associated with. But it was just someone to get in for £17 million, who Wenger clearly doesn't fancy for one reason or another. And the whole situation is strange. And I just think Gazidis wants success. And I, I think, like like me... I think he's unsure that Arsene Wenger is the man to take that forward. And, and like you said, he's got to be very core cool and very political about the situation because at the end of the day, he is an employee, but so is Arsene Wenger. <laughs> and that, that's where it's mad because we've got a whole club on eggshells and, and a lot of ex-players, a lot of the Invincibles were f- frozen out and, and, and not allowed to be a part of things by all accounts. And it, it's just weird the way things are going, but... I hope there isn't an offer on the table until we, we see what Arsenal achieves. And for me, even if he does achieve fourth place and wins an FA Cup, that ain't enough. And it might sound very 
very strange of me to say that, but I just think we'd be massively underachieving. And you, you can talk all you like about what what the players have done and all that, but I just think that we've had one man in charge of the squad for for 13 years since we've won the title, and we've seen the same failings with different players. And it's it's, it's a repetitive nature. And I just think Gazidis wants to take this football club to the next level, and I'm not sure Cronky really gives a toss as long as he's getting his money in and with that TV deal he's laughing all the way to the bank and, and with the stadium and like I said the match day revenue Arsenal set up and he's set up to be making money for a while but I think if we want to go to the next level and, and, and we do want to compete with the top clubs in Europe it has to happen now because I think two years ago there was an opportunity to, to, to make the change we didn't do it we stuck with it I think two years ago was the time where Wenger should have changed his backroom staff and we should have done that whole transition two years ago and now I think we're two years on yeah, two years and we're behind. back to square one. Yeah. We, it's, it's madness. And, and then we're going to get overtaken, mate. So personally, I'd cut ties, but that's just me. I'd cut ties. I'd, I'd go big. I know people talking about young, man. I'd go big. I'd go for uh, someone like Allegri. I'd go with someone who has been there, done it, who's a, a modern day manager, who's a tactician. Like you've seen what Potocino and all people like that are doing. They're modern day managers. They've got fresh ideas. Fresh, fresh way of looking at football. They will galvanise this squad. They'll achieve the best out of all these players, implement a system to get the best out of them. And, and we could really go on levels on the pitch, which, like you said, will catapult us and Gazidis off the pitch. He could command anything. He could command levels, couldn't he? Because a lot of them deals are going to be up for renewal pretty soon as well. So he knows that if we're not, when they're not, we're not a big club, we're not challenging, we're not in the Champions League, it's going to be much, much harder to, 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 for him to get one of these big deals and then he'll be the one getting that to go out, won't he? <laughs> Indeed. I mean, Phil, you know, following on from what I said and what you said earlier, I mean, there's a lot of changes <clears throat> that need to happen this summer. And it all centres around Wenger's situation. I mean, we're spinning so many plates, we don't know. Nobody seems to know whether it's the players, the fans, the people in the, you know, behind the scenes. Nobody knows what's happening, what's going on. And we can't really move forward until that situation is, 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 is resolved. You know, um, in terms of, you know, um, we've got 12 contracts, including Wenger's to sort out. You know, ideally this summer, sorry, you know, 11 contracts outside of 11, uh, Wenger's to, to sort out really this summer. You know, um, we've, we've, we've got, I know, I know we've got extra money coming in from the TV deal, but we can only use a certain amount of that, an increment of that money for player wages. You know, so costs are going up. We should have really gone big a couple of years ago when the, the, the rate of the pound was more favorable. You know, so we've got a lot of, um, um, issues to deal with, but do you feel, do you feel confident or is there anything that you've seen or read or whatever or you've heard that makes you feel that the club will make the necessary changes for us to move forward. I, the thing is, I don't think these these changes can happen in one summer. Mm. I think I personally don't see Wenger as the man to take us forward from this point. You know, I think this season just showed it again. We've had our best squad for for years. We've been set in every position. We've we've got the infrastructure. We've got the the talent. We've got the the setup. You know. And we just haven't kicked on. And for me, I would I would try and go for someone else. But I don't think it's going to happen now. It's too late. I mean, you can't. You should be like you would with a, a transfer. You would be, you know, talking to agents, maybe the player themselves, six months before. Um, I don't know if the club have tried to do that, but you know there was rumours about Allegri. But I mean, you can't go to these top managers in. Let's say Wenger doesn't renew, or the club don't want him to renew anymore. That's in July, okay? We're going to be searching for a manager in July? I don't think so, because you, you need transfer business in place. You need, you need you need sporting directors on the same wavelength. You need these people. It's just it's just a, a, a mess at the moment, and the uncertainty is is filtering through from top to bottom out onto the pitch, and it's just not helping anyone. Um, and the fans as well, you know. I, obviously, I don't. There's no room for violence, especially between each other. But it's just it's just driving people mad. You know, this is Arsenal is 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 a passion. It's their life to a lot of people. It's it's our lives, you know. And watching the same things happen again and again is just it's frustrating because you don't you want to see improvement, you want to see change, and there's just nothing. We don't know at the moment what's what's going to happen in, let, next week, let alone in the summer. Mm -hmm. So. I do think changes need to be made, and I think a sporting director would be, 
you know, a really beneficial beneficial change to the club because, you know, everyone knows that Wenger is doing everything. You know, he likes to be that hands-on manager. But that's not just that's just not how things work at the moment. And you need to delegate. You need guys, you know, sorting out all the different all the different areas and all the components that build a club because they want us to be a super club. Well, you can't be a super club with just one man at the helm, you know, and it's all about modernization. Like you said, with Pochettino, we need to get up to speed and it's just not happening at the moment, but you know, we'll see. Can he change? I don't know, but I definitely think there will be some changes within the club uh, this summer. I think we're going to leave it on that. Um, interesting note i hope everybody that listened really enjoyed the podcast i want to thank phil for coming on uh we won't talk about the daily mill which you used to write for because it's no <laughs> longer there you know but um I hopefully you enjoyed your first stint with us uh phil no no it was great yeah the time went really quickly actually so yeah, yeah no wrong time to talk about the arsenal indeed indeed and also was thank you very much always, for having me on mike as always as always as always we'll, we'll catch up again uh you go in palace on monday I will be there, mate, yes. I'll yes. catch up with you before. I don't know where you're drinking, but I'll probably catch you up before the game then. And Yeah, I'll be about yeah. nice and early, so I'll yeah. give you a shout. Coolio, coolio. All right, so that's another Good Ramble podcast. Catch us on all the platforms. Catch us again next week when we'll be discussing the uh, Palace game and looking ahead to that really big, fantastic, exciting game up in the northeast corner of England against Middlesbrough. So, um tune in for that one all right so that's been the kuna ramble podcast i've been your host giles once again thanks again for listening up the arsenal this podcast is sponsored by the tollington arms on hornsey road a bubbly pub with a thai kitchen home to thousands of arsenal fans every season open daily from noon